Hi, Lita. Hi, Bob. How are you? Okay. Good. I know you're a little under the weather, and I appreciate you making the effort anyway. No problem. Um, the uh, Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright, Blogging Heads TV. You are Lita Cosmetes. Um, and I feel very lucky to have you because you are a true foundational figure in evolutionary psychology. Do you deny that? I do not deny it. <laughs> I was afraid you'd be over overwhelmed by humility or something, but no. <laughs> no. no. Uh, and I, I, there's a couple of things I want to talk about with you. Um, but I want to start with a, with a little uh, paper you published last year that you, you were a co-author of. And just spend a little time on that. Uh, because it, 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 when I first looked at it, I thought the moral of the story was that you had confirmed that liberals are wimps. But then I realized it's more complicated than that. It's, it's that upper class liberals are wimps. Working class liberals are, are, are real men. have more, more upper body strength. Right. Or we think right. it's the other way around, actually, that your upper body strength for a man, not for women, but for men, that their upper body strength is related to their attitudes about resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is, if you look in evolutionary biology, there are um, models of dominance, uh, like the asymmetric war of attrition is what, what one of them is called. And these models say that if you are having, if two animals are having a contest over resources, um, it makes sense for the more, for the, if you have two, if they differ in formidability and how much harm they can inflict on each other, that it makes sense for the, the one that's less formidable to back down and let the more formidable one take the resource. Um, and you mostly get fights when two individuals are similar in their formidability. If you think about it that way, then the question is in the modern world, how do we, um, how does that translate into how we think about resources in the modern world? And so with, um, with some of our, our colleagues, uh, Michael Peterson, the first author of the paper is a political scientist and mm -hmm. Daniel Steezer, an anthropologist to, uh, from Argentina. Um, we wanted to ask about political attitudes about redistribution because they're very much uh, that's very much about resources mm -hmm. and so on this theory when you have uh, a lot of resources you you you'll want to um it's it's in your interest to not give them up if you are lacking resources it's in your interest to take them from somebody else on this view and so the idea was uh that uh, formidability in men, which we've we've operationalized in a lot of research as men's upper body strength, mm -hmm. uh, which we can measure at the gym and in a lot of different ways, uh, should have some effect. It, it, this ancestral logic of dominance should have some effect in the modern world in how people think about things. And so what we found was that if you're more or less, if you're above the median in income, the stronger you are, the more opposed you are to redistribution. And if you're below the median income, the stronger you are, the more in favor of redistribution you are. Um, and and that, tur that turned out to be the case? That turned out to be the case it, in all three places we looked, Denmark, Argentina, and the U.S. Mm -hmm. And those are places that differ a lot in their attitudes towards social welfare. Okay. Um, okay. Yet the same pattern was in all three places. Okay. Now, now I'm getting a little echo, so I'm going to take this out and see if that changes it. Uh, it hasn't yet, actually. Um, so maybe I'll put it back in. It certainly hasn't improved it. But anyway, just to be clear, I think what you're not saying is that, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the upper class, or the higher socioeconomic status guys with a lot of upper body strength were also born with conservative genes. The idea is more like on the playground in junior high or wherever they're they're you know, as they grow up, they they get their way more often by virtue of their strength, and this affects their attitude about like taking stuff from them and taking stuff from other people. Well, you could think about it that way, and that may be the way it works. It could also be that your strength right now is just changing a little dial in your head mm -hmm. about how you how entitled you feel mm -hmm. to getting your own way. So mm -hmm. we we have we have other another set of experiments that have to do with anger, um, that that oh, that show that. Stronger men feel more entitled to be treated well. They feel uh, they report more success in resolving conflicts of interest in their own favor. Um, they anger more easily. Um, they more easily feel that people are not putting enough weight on their welfare. Hmm. Uh, they endorse the use of force more, both interpersonally, and we also looked at their political attitudes about war, right. about the military, and we did that to rule out rational choice explanations that just because you you've had more fights that therefore you are projecting this and uh onto that 
that just because you've had more fights that you're that this reflects nothing more than that because in the modern world in the ancestral world if you're in coalitions of two three four men, men your own strength is going to have a lot to do with the success of your coalition but in the modern world the success of the american military how efficacious it is has nothing to do with your own you know, flex biceps or circumference or any other aspect of your upper body strength. Right. Right. And we, when we asked, we, we had noticed in the run up to the Iraq war that conversations in the press tended to have two different points of view. One was uh, about terrorism. One was uh, they actually, they hit us, they hit us. And so we have to hit them back or else we'll do it more. And the other view was, uh, they hit us, we can't do anything because then they'll hurt us even more. So we made questions that were sort of like that. And it turns out that the men with more upper body strength endorse more the ones that they hit us, so we have to hit them back uh, uh, or they'll hurt us more. Okay. Well, and I can report that I am a data point consistent with that finding. And, and we won't go, we won't go any, any further into my... my uh, physical attributes or lack thereof. But um, now I want to get back to this business of you being a foundational figure in evolutionary psychology, because what prompted me to get in touch with you is, you know, we had Rob Kurzban on not long ago talking about his book, which is about evolution and the modular mind. And I was talking to him about modules and the idea that, you know, what we, these psycholo these modules in the mind, uh, this idea that, what we think of as the conscious self isn't nearly as important in, in, in an executive sense as we might think it is. And in a way, it's just another module. I think he kind of put it that way. Anyway, I thought, well, if we're talking modules, we have to go to uh, one of the one of the sources, which would be you, because early on in evolutionary psychology, you were emphasizing um, the, 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 the modular view of the mind. And if I can just quickly capsulize how I think that happened um, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, kind of blowing up. Let me see if I've, I've got it right. I mean, initially, you were emphasizing these mental modules um, as a, in response to a view that was critical of evolutionary psychology and which maintained that the mind was kind of a blank slate and we were just born as kind of general learning machines and you didn't need to have a lot of specific tools built in, a lot of specific software built in. You just magically learn about everything. You and John Tooby, your husband and frequent collaborator and some other people uh, replied that no, when you look at actually what people in artificial intelligence have to do to get a computer to do anything at all comparable to what we do, like say recognize a face, there needs to be a ton of kind of built-in stuff, right? And that's how uh, you, the, the metaphor of a Swiss army knife came to enter the, the debate, right? The mind has all these specific tools like a Swiss army knife. And I'm right. later going to suggest that that metaphor has its shortcomings. But anyway, do I have it right so far? Very, very, mis one of the more misunderstood metaphors, but yes. Um, well, well, there's different concepts. One is, uh, as opposed to blank slate or domain general mechanisms, mechanisms that operate uniformly across many domains. In contrast to that, you can think of domain specific mechanisms that are more like expert systems that are well designed for, for um, processing information about a particular adaptive problem, like, you know, detecting predators, attending to animals, reasoning about social exchange or cheater detection and, and so on. Um, and, and one of the things we were first arguing is there have to be a lot of domain specific mechanisms in the mind for it to learn anything at all. Mm -hmm. Um, the term module started out in artificial intelligence to have a very clean, nice meaning, which was, um, a, a, a mechanism that's, uh, well engineered for solving a particular task. And that is how, that's how we meant the term module. It then got Jerry Fodor took, you know, wrote a book you know, modularity of mind, where he added all kinds of weird conditions on a module, except not the idea that it's a, that they're adaptations. And it just caused a lot of confusion because well, a lot of people started to think we were saying that these these modules or these adaptive specializations, they never interact, that their outputs, they never interact with one another right, and so forth, right. and, which is one of the problems with the Swiss Army knife. Right. Is people assume that each tool uh, 
is the, the line is that what we're saying is each tool is operating independently of the others with no interaction between them, which is not even actually how you use a Swiss Army knife. But anyway, um, and that, that there was no that was never any every metaphor has its strengths right. and, and right. weaknesses, and uh, that's not yeah. how it's meant it to be. Yeah. It seems to me there's another uh, possible shortcoming of the Swiss Army knife metaphor, particularly in the context that I'm interested in, which is this question of whether kind of the, you know, the self as we think of it is as powerful as we think or even exists. Uh, and, and it's this. I mean, th there are some modules that are really very much just like little tools, kind of, like let's take facial recognition, you know, that's kind of like a little tool you deploy all the time in, in little ways. Um, and, and, and there's no way that that's going to kind of substitute for what we think of as the self because it's not motivational. It, you know, it's just there and, 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 and there has to be, you know, kind of something using it, right, in a certain sense. But then there's, there's also, um, I don't know if you'd call all of these things modules, but there are times when um, kind of, you know, conglomerations of adaptive functionality almost take over our consciousness and really change the way we behave and what we're motivated to do. And, and sometimes we, we, maybe it's easiest to think of these as emotions commonsensically. I mean, people think of like jealousy just completely taking, changing what you're obsessed with and focused on and the way you see evidence and everything. Um, but, but anyway, I guess I'm kind of distinguishing between modules that are tools and therefore have to have a user in some sense, even if it's just a, a, a bigger module, and then modules that, that, yeah, you might think they, they sometimes become what we think of as the self or, or kind of, you know, serve a, a motivation, a, a basic function of motivation and orientation, kind of. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, except the, the problem is that there's no good account of what people mean by the self. We all experience ourselves as, um, as, as a self. We all have the experience of personal agency. There's other components of of what you can think of as a self as well. Um, there's our knowledge of our own personality traits. There's our, uh, there our, our fund of memories of episodes from our own lives, mm -hmm. which we also think is part of what it means to be me. Um, uh, as the cause of I, the cause of my actions, agency in that sense, there's a lot of different components. That's that the one I'm mainly thinking about. Um, Yes, that's the one that's least un least understood. And there's also there's also just um, when you think about we, we associate it with conscious awareness too. But there's different kinds of conscious awareness. So there's perceptual consciousness of just the room around me that that kind of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But then there's also when you reflect on things uh, when you're I, I would say when you're having meta representations and, and making and inferences about counterfactual worlds when you're supposing suppose I went you know downtown today then what would i do mm -hmm. i'm imagining a world that doesn't exist yet and i may and there's inferences that are being made about it by this head um however you want to call the self and uh that's a kind of different form of consciousness than just when i just see the world around me um right. and so it's, right. it's hard to know how to think about you know what's the consciousness for um is it for anything is it an epiphenomenon is is it a blackboard that broadcasts information to a lot of different functionally specialized mechanisms. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what it is and why we're built that way. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. I was reading uh, this paper that you and John wrote uh, that was published in, I think, the Handbook of Emotions or something in 2000. And you were talking about the adaptive function of emotions. And you and one example you came up with was jealousy. And you went through the ways that changes your fundamental orientation and how it kind of mobilizes the organism to do certain things, which involves seeing things in certain ways. And I thought, well, that's kind of a module. I mean, it obviously involves the mobilization of a lot of submodules, a lot of modules. But do you, do you think of that as a module? I think of I, emotions like that. I, I think we, John Tooby and I, John and I think about them in a sort of a way that's different than a lot, way a lot of people think about emotions. People often think about emotions just in terms of the affective experience that that 
that feeling that you have. But if, if you think about a, a mind with lots of different mechanisms in it, uh, some of them are going to have outputs that are inconsistent with one another. Um, so you, if you were, uh, let's say you're a zebra and you're eating and there's a, a lion over there that looks very sated. It doesn't look like it's very hungry. But suddenly, let's say you see the eye flick where it's looking, looking at you and you and yours in a way that's suggesting it might be about to hunt. Um, you need to shut down all the the feeding activity, whatever else you were doing, and go into a different mode of, mode that has to do with avoiding the mm-hmm. predation, to avoid predation. Um, and so which you, you can think about certain emotions, and that, that would be fear, fear of predators, for example, and I, I think we have that as well, um, as solving a problem of mechanism coordination, that there are some adaptive problems, ancient ancestral adaptive problems, that were so important, and it was so important that you not make mistakes, that we've evolved superordinate pro- programs that solve the problem of shutting down certain mechanisms and activating other mechanisms in ways that are very well coordinated for solving a particular adaptive problem. And sure, you can think of sexual jealousy um, that way. I mean, the idea is it would shift your attention. You're suddenly going to be paying attention to things like simultaneous absence. You know, if your spouse and the person you suspect are uh, both not here at the same time, that's going to seem, no, usually we don't notice simultaneous absence. Right, Most people right. in the world are absent right now. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't notice that. Usually. It's going to focus your attention in different ways. You're going to have um, episodic memories. You're going to retrieve episodes from the past where, huh, if you were a man, huh, she got really dressed up at that for that party. And she usually doesn't do that, but he was going to be there. What's, you know, mm-hmm. you start reevaluating past uh, episodes. So there's memory retrieval functions that are changing. Inferences are, are changing about what what people's behavior means. It might be goals that are activated for mate guarding, for keeping track of where your spouse is and what they're doing and who they're talking to. Um, and it's very hard to, to shut that off. It's very hard if you have to study for a calculus test to do that when your whole sexual jealousy system is activated. By I would say by design. And it doesn't mean that you're not thinking or not processing information, it's that you're processing information in a particular way that's well suited for solving that adaptive problem. And part of that emotional state is to deactivate other kinds of adaptive problem mechanisms that are designed for other kinds of adaptive problems. Um, right. And, and that is as taking over from the point of view of the state that we're usually in where there's not a specific kind of coordination that's going on, but a lot of different mechanisms are bubbling up and down in terms of their activation. Right. And, and I'm interested in the way you put that. It's taking over. It's not like you reflected on it and said, I think I'll right. go into jealousy mode. Right. No, not at all. It should be, these should be triggered by cues, ancestrally reliable cues that the situation has arisen. Right. And so it- obviously seeing your spouse having sex with somebody would be one of those cues. Uh, there could be all kinds of different cues, and, and that's an empirical question, what they are in any particular case. Um, but yeah, it, it, once trig- it, it will be triggered by these cues, and once it's triggered, it should just click all sorts of mechanisms into place. Yeah. And the reason that interests me, I mean, I told you I have this little agenda, which is that I'm interested in the, in the, the connection between this, the Buddhist idea that the self does, in some sense does not exist, and the modular model of the mind. And in the, in the Buddha's basic discourse on the not-self, he, he makes two points. He says, one, if you, you know, if you think there's a self, look at how many things you actually can't control. You don't have complete control of your mind. You don't have complete control of your body, your, your feelings, and so on. And, and that's why it's interesting that you, you put it that way. I mean, it's like you don't choose the module. The module chooses you almost. You know? Right. right. Except that what is the you anyway? I mean, I don't know. Well, exactly. That's the next step is, 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 is this suggests that the you isn't what you had thought it to be if it's not choosing the state of mind. Right. And, and then the other thing the Buddha emphasizes is that the self, you would, well, by, he implicitly, because he emphasizes the impermanence of things in this argument. He goes through your, everything is so impermanent in your mind. So in other words, he has this idea of the self as something that persists through time in some sort of constant form. And that's another sense in which if, if, if things like jealousy are just seizing control, you know, you're literally not the same person you were when, before. 
but which is you. Exactly. Yeah, so, so, so anyway, you see, you, you can they're see. They're all you. Right? I mean, they're all you. They're all, they're just all you in different states, or at least they're, they're all you in the sense of this organism contained in this head and body. Um, because the other sense of you is very puzzling. And, and it's this sense of personal agency is really hard to, um, it's actually hard to break with, uh, it's hard to break by lesions and brain damage or drugs. It's, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to disrupt that sense of agency. You mean the sense that I, the conscious me, am in charge? Yeah, and then I'm the author of my actions. It's, so, it's very hard to break that. It's a very deep-seated intuition. It's a deep-seated, more than an intuition, it's an, we directly experience ourselves that way, right? And you can, you can disrupt it with things like in, in hypnotic suggestion, you can have somebody raise their arm and they don't, have, they don't experience it as that I am raising my arm. They experience it as my arm is being raised. Um, mm -hmm. There are things that you can do to disrupt that sense of agency, but it's, it's really hard to just knock it out. Um, but there's a lot of experimental evidence that it is mistaken or, or well, overstated. You mean how much it's governing all of your actions? Yeah. Sure. In including the split brain experiments done by your, your colleague, Mike Gazzaniga, whom you know very well. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, of course, that's a strange set of uh, circumstances because signals are going back and forth. To right. They're not anatomically normal people, so there's a limit to what we can infer right. from those, but they're interesting. Right. And it's interesting also that people have this, that people spin narratives about their own life and what it means. I think that's an interesting phenomenon and somewhat puzzling. Why is that? Well, and, are... and they, and they, um, and there seem to be patterns in the way we, we try to do that, right? There's a whole literature on how we present ourselves. Sure. And and what sure. what would you say? I mean, what what, what are the patterns you that, that you think are most important in the way people present themselves? I I, I actually don't I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, it's going to differ with your audience, with who who you're dealing with, uh, and and what the issues are in, in different relationships. But I think we do this also just when we're not interacting with people at all. I mean, don't you spend a lot of time? trying to understand your own life in a certain sense. I mean, I do. Uh, I'm working on it, yeah. <laughs> and I do it um, partly for my own. I, I, don't, I do it. Let me just put, it's something that my brain spends time doing, whether I'm talking to other people or not. Now, whether that's preparing to deal with other people, and, and that's why we're designed to do it that way, I, you know, I don't know. But it's an interesting, you can imagine a human being functioning in the world without feeling the need to generate coherent stories about why their life has gone the way they, it has. Right. And, but that does seem to be something everyone emphasizes, coherence. Yes. Um, accounts as coherent is an interesting question, too. Yeah, but con con internally consistent as, as, it is, as that is judged by society, acceptably consistent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have this it's with fiction, too. It's the same thing. But, the, but there's a sense in which it's very unsatisfying if a work of fiction seems to completely violate everything you know about human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, it, that's when a story rings false uh, instead of ringing true, even though you know that in fiction everything is false. Everything about the particular situation is untrue. Um, but there still could be this deeper level at which it's, it's true because it's 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 saying something about the unfolding of human character and of behavior in real situations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the module thing is, I mean, it's, it's as I'm sure you're aware, it, it's complicated and subtle because, um, you know, I was, uh, I was looking at this book. I don't know if you've seen this by Douglas Kenrick and mm -hmm. some colleagues. I think it's called The Rational Animal or something. Anyway, they, I don't, they may use the word modules at one point. They prefer the term sub-selves. <clears throat> and by that, they mean certain selves are activated by things like the mate attraction self. I mean, as you know, you put males in the presence of, of women they find attractive and a few things change. Their 
their their uh, time discounting rate, you know, or, or their or whatever, you know, whether they're willing to trade off ten dollars today for fifteen next month. In the pre- you know, if they see an attractive woman, they're they they they're more inclined to want the money now. Uh, they're more inclined to describe their career aspirations in grandiose terms involving the accumulation of wealth and so on. There's a lot of things like that. And uh, so on the one hand, you could think, yeah, it's just like, and you're not even aware of it. You know, the guy's probably not aware of it, you know, th- that this happened. But suddenly he's thinking in a different way and there's a kind of a channel change. At the same time, there's a lot of stuff he was doing before he saw these attractive women that he's still doing. So it's not it's not quite quite like move this module out and bring this one on stage, right? And yet there is a coherence about the new set of responses you're going to get from him, right? So that's it's it's complicated to think about, though. They, they talk about it in terms of uh, functional goals being activated, and that those when certain functional goals are activated, a lot of other a lot of other uh, processes of attention and inference and memory and just time discounting, as you said, are shifted in how they operate. Uh, but yeah, that doesn't have to be taking over um, everything you're doing in the way that certain emotions do. Uh, right. Which... So, so in that sense, it's not like it's completely, uh, I mean, I guess a defender of the self, a defender of the idea of the self might say, well, it doesn't completely take over, but then your reply, I think, would be, well, yeah, but what was there before? I wouldn't call that the self either, right? I mean, it's always, as you put it in an email to me, it's always modules, right? There's always right. some psychological mechanism doing something. It's creating our experience of the world. It's creating our perception of the world. Um, it, it, that's why I wouldn't say that domain-specific mechanisms color our perceptions. I'd say that they create our perceptions. That there's no such thing as perceiving the world in a um, a way that doesn't involve carving it and some it, carving it conceptually into pieces. Um, right. There's no right. point of view from nowhere. But you know how I became interested in the connection with Buddhism is I actually went to some of these like one week silent meditation retreats, and I have not attained enlightenment by any means or even become what I would call a very good meditator. But I realized. The idea is, for the very serious Buddhist contemplative, the idea is to come as close to that as possible. What you just described. It's the view from nowhere. And right. and I'm convinced that some of these people get pretty close. <laughs> well, I'd say that, 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 that still, from a, from, a, uh, from a certain point of view, it's still a view from somewhere. It's still a human mind that's, um, that's perceiving the world as opposed to the minds of other species. And uh, if you could imagine extraterrestrials that are really designed very differently, but it may be without some of these um, functional goals being activated without some of these emotional states taking, be, taking over um, or, or, you know, flipping your mind into a particular configuration. It may be that it's a situation where lots of different mechanisms in your head can, are, are sort of able to respond to the the environment that you're experiencing, um, as opposed to some being shut down and some being activated. Right. And I would say, I mean, you mentioned emotion reaction. I would say more broadly, our natural affective responses to things, and our and our kind of learned affective responses to things. You know, our affective responses to individual people we've learned to hate or like or. Uh, certain smell, certain. The idea is that you lose that. Uh, I, I don't mean many people do this, but if you ask where does the path ultimately lead, I think one way of saying it is it is is you know I mean the, the Buddha himself said uh, you know supposedly said uh, you know it's about ceasing to crave things you know. To, to be attracted to things in a clean way and ceasing to to have the aversion to unsatisfactory things. Well, in the realm of affect, that about covers it, right? Sure. So, yeah. so. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean the information is not still in your head, but it's not being retrieved. And then you could say retrieved by what? Uh, by the self, by a certain set of mechanisms that we identify with conscious experience. I mean, right now, you're probably, there's lots of experiences you've had in your life that are not um, available 
to your conscious awareness right now. But if you were to think about it, if I, I said to you, tell me something about your junior year in college, right? You, you know, you could think about that. You could probably tell me something about it, but you weren't thinking about it before. Mostly stuff I don't want to talk about, actually. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Um, but it's an interesting phenomenon that all this information can exist in our heads and all those programs can still exist in our heads, yet presumably in certain kinds of meditative states, they're just not being activated. That's and actually that a good, that's a very good way of saying it because in mindfulness meditation, the idea, it's not that you can shut down all reactions a person might have, it's that you observe the reaction starting to take shape, an affective reaction and you view it as objectively as possible. And for that reason, it doesn't bring the follow through that it normally might. It it doesn't trigger a whole, you know, you think about somebody you you don't like and you, 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 you sense the dislike and in a certain sense you feel it, but you're keeping it at a distance in a way that prevents it from going into, well, let's list all your grievances against the person, what a terrible person they are and so on. Right. I actually personal belief, not from my research or anything. I think that it's important to uh, that people be internally honest and that they acknowledge uh, reactions that they have to the world, even if they're ones they wish they didn't have, even if they think that they're nasty reactions or bad reactions, because the alternative, then there's a chance of uh, behaving differently or not acting on those reactions in a way that I think is much more difficult to do if you deny that those that you have those reactions and then just let different mechanisms in your head steal the show. Uh, so, you know, I mean, there's going to be a lot of situations in which it's really hard not to have uh, a, 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 an emotional response activated that's going to click your whole head into a particular situation. Um, but I think you have a better chance of leading a more reasonable life if you acknowledge these these feelings and these reactions when you have them and then think about it. And I've always thought that evolutionary psychology had the virtue of making it harder not to do that. Making it harder not to, yes, not, I think so. Making it harder not to be aware of um, the stuff going on and the fact that it it's just this kind of product of... Uh, natural selection, which isn't a, a process that you should necessarily let choose all your values for you. Right. Or without the double negatives, evolutionary psychology makes you able to be more self-aware, more aware of your own reactions. And I would say more able to choose the path you want to choose and weave meaning into your life the way you want to, or, and whoever the you is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Assuming you exist. And uh, if not, we'll rephrase that accordingly. Um, well, it's, it's a, Cognitive psychologists, I mean, I, I'm uncomfortable ever using the term you because at some point you want to cash all these things out as computational systems. And then the question is, what's that computational system? And mm -hmm. we're not even close uh, to understanding. That. Yeah. Here's a question related to that. Um, when you think of modules and consciousness, I mean, on the one hand, you can think of certain modules doing their work without you being conscious of them, I guess. Right. Yes. All the time. All right. right now. Yeah. Right now. What most of my visual system is doing is my, most of my visual system is doing things that I'm not even that that our minds are not even designed to become conscious of. Right. There, there are systems analyzing color. There are systems analyzing whether there's motion present. But that but different systems that analyze the direction of motion, uh, other systems that are analyzing shape. And they're all doing these things separately. But the only thing that we've become consciously aware of is when all this is integrated and put together in a percept of the world. So I'm seeing your face right now. And, uh, you know, we have face perception mechanisms. We don't, we're not capable of becoming consciously aware of the computations of each of these little systems. Um, and why, why, why should there be conscious access to them? It would be ridiculous. Um, the, I, I can't think of a good reason why the mind should be designed to become conscious of the million different sub mechanisms that are there, right. as opposed to some high level inferences. Right. And, and then there are kinds of modules that you could view as, I mean, what happens when a module, you know, so to speak, takes over consciousness or at least carves up some, some acreage within consciousness. Let's, let's take like a jealous reaction or you get angry or, or you, you get loving towards it, whatever. 
um, or you get interested in the Super Bowl, <laughs> whatever happens. Um, you could say that that what's happening is that different modules are kind of competing for some degree of control of your consciousness. Um, I've seen it put this way by people. It makes a certain amount of sense to me. So you can you can almost imagine a bunch of modules like, uh, well, sometimes they're just biding their time. There's not a lot of evidence on their side, right? Like, like say, jealousy, right? I mean... You know, there must be a kind of monitoring going on because when some things happen with a mate, it gets your attention, right? And so, so you could imagine certain modules normally being unconscious and, and not very active, but then they 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 uh, at at some point they get activated and and maybe compete with other modules for access to your consciousness. Does that make sense? Uh, sure, and well, access to all kinds of things. I mean. In the, you, there's frequently, if you have a, a multi-modular mind or a mind full of, of functional specializations, each one designed to solve a different adaptive problem, there's nothing to prevent you from being in situations where there's a number of different adaptive problems facing you at the moment. And then there's a question of prioritization, which ones are, or ancestrally, which ones would have been most important to prioritize. Um, that means that a lot of times, which one wins out in terms of determining your, you, you only have one set of behavioral responses at a given time. I have one body to behave in the world. Uh, so my actions have to be generated by one of these systems um, it, when, they're giving, when they're giving competing outputs. So if one system is saying, go to sleep, and another system is saying, forage for food, another system is saying, get the hell out of here because there's a predator right near you. Right? Um, I can't do all of those things at once because they're mutually inconsistent. And ancestrally, the, there's a predator right here near you. You would expect that to, um, our, our minds to have been designed to prioritize that above the other things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so whether you want to call that competing for conscious access or not, it certainly is competing for behavioral, which system is going to be controlling your behavior at this moment. Um, and yes, it might have to be controlling whatever conscious access, whatever conscious access is, it might be competing for that resource. But it also can be just that those, this, the correct state for all kinds of mechanisms for evading predators is all activated at once. And those are different states than would be activated when you're foraging for food and different ones that would be activated when you're tired and about to go to sleep. Um, so it doesn't have to be just your consciousness, whatever that is, that's taken over, but you're, you're, you're going to have domain specific attentional systems, domain specific decision rules, memory retrieval systems, all kinds of systems that are going to be flipped into a particular mode of activation hmm. in certain hmm. kinds of situations. And of course, there's sometimes when what you might describe as two modules are competing because their goals are incompatible. So at, at least, you know, if you're deciding whether to eat something that at some level you think is bad for you, you feel as if there are two contending parties within you. Should I, should I, I, should I, the time. what's, yeah, should I have the, so powdered sugar donut and, you know, and do you think of those as two different modules competing? You know, you can think of it that way or as goal systems. And it, in a sense, it doesn't matter, and it, you know, how many, mechanisms is my television made of mm -hmm. uh, you know you could be a lumper you could be a splitter you could say you know a thousand different mechanisms you could say you know four systems i don't care <laughs> i don't care how you how you describe it but what's important is that they are described and uh in a way that's computationally tractable eventually and um, not mysterious and where, where people take the what these things are designed to do seriously as mm -hmm as a way of guiding the research to figure out how the mind works. We don't know most of how the mind works. You know. But the, the, the key thing is to recognize functional organization in, in, That's right. in components. Yeah. And, and not just recognize it, but have theories about functional organization that guide your research to find things that you would never otherwise think to look for. Because if a lot of our mechanisms are operating outside of our conscious awareness, there's going to be a whole lot of mechanisms that we don't have intuitions about. Right? Mm -hmm. that we're, we're never going to find by consulting any kind of intuition. 
And But you can find, if you have a theory about what kinds of adaptive problems our hunter-gatherer ancestors had to be good at solving. And there's a lot of research that has discovered new things about the mind that nobody ever knew before because people took those questions seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's, a, here's a question related to this, this idea of modules kind of competing for attention. You know, I don't know if you paid much attention to the work on the default mode network, but it's basically the mind wandering, right? And I, I have different colleagues that tell me different things about it. So, okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, you're familiar, you know, you're familiar you with your you have to with no task, no particular task to do with it. It's the network that's activated when. That's right. True. When you're not doing anything in particular, just walking down the street, whatever, you, 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 your attention doesn't have to be focused on any goal. You know, your mind wanders and things come up like oh, I'm supposed to have lunch tomorrow, or, oh, I wonder if I offended that person, or, oh, I wonder how I could impress this other person, or whatever. But it kind of wanders from thing to thing. And that seems to me like you could describe it as modules uh, asking for a little attention. Modules, right? I mean, each one is being triggered by something. Uh, sometimes it's by another thought that you had. Sometimes it's by something that sort of passes by your gaze that you don't even realize that you saw. And uh, yeah, each one is being triggered by something and and doing its thing. And sometimes we become aware of what it, of its outputs, and sometimes we don't become aware of its outputs. But the outputs are there, being fed into other mechanisms. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, it seems that certain types of outputs are the kind that enter consciousness when they assert their relevance. Right. But that doesn't mean that the outputs are not um, being entered into other systems, even when we're not attending to them and not consciously aware of them. That can be going on as well. You know, that um, a mechanism that's concerned with, you know, did I offend this so-and-so, even if you're not, even if you're not um, attending to that question, if it, if it gets activated, it's, its outputs can be fed into other systems. Like, what should I do about that? And then later you become aware of the output of those systems, like, oh, I should really do something nice for that person that might have been offended by what I did. And, and you, know, you know, that may come into your head that's something that would be a good thing to do, and you may not even realize the chain of inferential causation that led to it. Yeah, solutions just pop up sometimes. A lot of the time. Yeah, and, which is kind of funny when you think of it, because often the problem did at some point enter your conscious awareness, so you became aware of the problem. Then the solution pops up, and you kind of wonder if you can, if the solution can be reached unconsciously, why'd you have to be conscious of the problem in the first place? There's, yeah, there's an older literature, not with adaptive problems, but with other kinds of problems, um, that w- said that you have to be thinking about a problem a lot before before that happens. Uh, So I used to, when I was in high school and I was taking calculus, I'd be working on some problem at home, you know, homework problem. And if I was stuck on it, you know, I'd think about it and I realized I was stuck. And sometimes I'd go play basketball and in the middle of playing basketball, the Mm -hmm. answer would pop into my head. Uh, Presumably there were mechanisms working on different possible solutions to that problem. And um, in a way that when I was really concentrating on it, the fact that I was focusing my attention was focusing my attention on just one path to solving the problem and blocking the other ones uh, or something like that. I, 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 yeah, it is an interesting thing. So here's a question. Um, you know, giving positive reinforcement to modules, you know, like, uh, well, like like the one that wants me to eat the powdered sugar donut or or... or or the emotion of rage, which wants me to, it doesn't want me to just feel it. It wants me to like go scream at somebody, pound on the desk and so on. I mean, there are ideas about whether quote, giving into such things um, increases their power in, in, in the future. And I think you could argue that it seems to be designed that way where, where uh, if, you know, modules, if you want to call them that, if they in some sense win or are they are they in some sense there's certain levels of behavior they can carry you to that constitute success at least in the sense of positive reinforcement at least in the sense of making giving the module more power next time around or or right now i mean in in anger lots of things happen when you when you're you get angry uh, we've been doing research with Aaron Sell about this um and uh, coming out of a theory that anger is triggered when somebody does something that 
makes you realize that they're putting much much too little weight on your welfare than you think you're entitled to as a function of the kind of relationship you have with the person. But when that is triggered, when the anger towards that person is triggered, um, certain things should happen. Because if anger is a system that's designed for interpersonal bargaining, for trying to get the other person to put more weight on your welfare in the future, then um, you should have certain motivations to communicate certain things to the person like, you imposed a really big cost on me. You may not think you did, but you did. Mm -hmm. um, and you did it for a small benefit to yourself. How could you do that? Um, I've been a very good cooperator with you. I've been a good friend to you. I've done a lot of things uh, for you in the past, which is an uh, expression of, you know, that I deserve to be treated better than you were treating me. And it's almost, it's very hard. In the modern world, there's a lot of situations where we can't express those thoughts to, to the other person. Like when you're in a court, in a lawsuit, you're not allowed to talk to the other person, to the person that you're in this conflict. And it could kill you because all these thoughts are hard to suppress. Um, sometimes you know there are situations where you really shouldn't ex express something to somebody, but everything in you wants to do that. I, in situations like that, sometimes I write, I write what I'm thinking um, because somehow that dissipates the impulse. It's somehow that's enough like communicating it, even if I don't send it to anybody, that I, it dissipates the impulse. And then I can go back to thinking about other more interesting things. Right? Um, but, 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 but until I do that, it just takes over and I can't think about other things. And I'm thinking obsessively about the, the thing that's making me making me angry. But certainly if you imagine something more like uh, the ancestral environment where the person was right there, you followed through in direct personal terms, yes. if you do that and they back down and go, I'm sorry, I'll be nicer in the future, that would be a kind of positive reinforcement that presumably Absolutely. makes the module more likely to assert itself in the future. I, I don't know if it makes it more likely to assert itself in the future. I think the module is going to be quite uh, good at asserting itself in situations where you think somebody's put too little weight on your welfare, it may be more likely to assert itself in the following sense. If you've successfully, the the reason for the person's behavior could be that they misunderstood what you consider to be a cost or a benefit. When mm -hmm. They misunderstood what's your, your welfare. Um, or it could be that they put too little weight on your welfare. On a, there's a variable in their head that, that has to do with how much weight they put on your welfare, and it was set too low. And them say, when they re realize you, the outcome of the argument could be, ah, I'm, I'm changing the weighting. I'm going to put more weight on your welfare in the future. Now, to the extent that you feel entitled to be treated better by that person in the future, um, there are, in principle, more situations that could make you angry, right? Because if I think that I'm entitled to better treatment, uh, there will be more possible things a person could do that will fall below that level. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to think about it as positive reinforcement. You could think about it as, okay, I've reset in my head the level of, of consideration I expect from that other person. And and it would become then easier for me to get mad at that person given that without thinking about it in behaviorist terms as positive reinforcement or not. Okay. And it would be different for different people, right? Because I may feel entitled to better treatment from, you know, from my husband than I do from a stranger on the street. And, it, and it's a sort of interesting thing that spouses often get uh, angry at each other over things that seem little, right? Mm -hmm. uh, compared to an acquaintance or a colleague, what you get angry about. And it's probably because with a spouse, you really do expect the person to put a lot of weight on your welfare. And so there's many other things there's many things they can do that seem to be signaling that they're not putting much weight on your welfare. Um, I've noticed so that myself, yes. We've all noticed that. Um, well, one reason I ask about the positive reinforcement question is because of kind of addiction, which often consists of our not being in the ancestral environment. Well, even junk food is, of course, a good example. I mean, in the, envi in the ancestral environment, it, there would have been less refined, you know, <laughs> sugar like zero would have been fruit. You would have had to work to get it and, and right. so on. So it so it doesn't become this kind of thing. And similarly, you know, something like pornography, addiction yeah. to pornography, uh, you know, in both of those cases, you're uh, you're seeing shortcuts that are available in the modern environment to forms of gratification that in the ancestral environment you would have had to work for probably couldn't have become super, super, super frequent and right. so on. And so I'm just kind of asking in both cases, um, the, the uh, you know, is this an example of these modules? I mean, there must be algorithms governing which modules get 
to govern our behavior, right? There, yeah. there, there, there may not be an executive self, but ultimately there have to be some algorithms governing what you could call competition in some cases among modules. And, yes, and, 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 and it seems to me the algorithm must have something to do with <clears throat> defining when, algor- when modules have been successful. In the ancestral environment, if you pursue an actual sexual encounter and have it, that's success. If you pursue a piece of fruit and get it, that's success. And it, so it seems to me, if you look at the dynamics of addiction, which is, you know, kind of actually every time you succumb, it makes it harder to break the habit. That's consistent with a with an algorithm that a, that gives more political power, in a sense, to a module every time it succeeds in natural selections terms of success. Um, I think some systems do work that way. I mean, there's there's there are some uh, there are some there are some motivational systems that really activate a reward system and dopaminergic pathways and so forth. And, and I think that, that, that there are, there are systems that work by positive reinforcement in that sense. I'm just saying that they don't all have to work that way. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, that doesn't have to be the design for all of them. That can be the design for some of them and not others. And right. I think it's just an open question. And I mean, as we've said, a lot of modules are not even kind of in this realm. They're more like tools that could be used within a number of motivational frameworks. Sure. But even these emotional systems that I've been talking about that that solve this problem of mechanism coordination, mm-hmm. it's not clear that they are activated, that, that every time that they're activated, that, that, um, that there's a positive reinforcement of their activation. Um, there are, there are you, you were talking about Buddhism and, uh, before, and there, there are strains of Buddhist thought that, that say, uh, that are in conflict with a lot of um, psychoanalytic views. Uh, but a lot of psychoanalytic views will say, well, you should experience, if you're feeling angry, angry, you should let yourself experience that. And you'll have Buddhist monks saying, no, you ought not to experience that. You ought to resist experiencing that. Although it's- actually it, there's an interesting distinction. I think a lot of them would say resisting the impulse is not quite what they're doing. They're well, developing a discipline that allows them to not feed it not feed it observe it and not feed it so it's right. not kind of the the southern baptist uh of, you know no. preacher of, uh, that i listened to when as a kid it's not repression it's not feeding it no but it is not feeding it and, and then it's interesting what does it mean to not feed anger one of the things it probably means to not feed anger is to not be obsessing over um how big the cost the person imposed on you was how small the benefit was did they do it on purpose mm-hmm. um these are all the kinds of things, how, how, how many things you did for them in the past. These are all the kinds of things that are going to feed that system and keep it activated, as opposed to distracting yourself or just letting some of those thoughts bubble and go, go away. That's very much a Buddhist description of it. Let, just let them vaporize. The, um, but, but this is a sense in which I think evolutionary psychology can be helpful. And, well, for that matter, just the, the findings of experimental social psychology in general, which I think are, uh, make more sense in light of evolutionary psychology. But all the, all the findings about our biased accounting systems. It's like, sure. of course, I'm keeping track of every grievance, you know, everything that person did to me and none of the things I did to that person. And it's just, it's a very well-established finding that we are not ob- objective in this regard. And it's... It can be useful to keep that in mind. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you uh, about brain scans. Um, oh, we're going outside my expertise, but ask away. I- I'm wondering if you. I'm, I'm sure you've kind of kept up with. It seems to me that they are um, that they're really interesting and potentially could could play a role in figuring the whole thing out, including functional organization. So, for example. The, the, the idea, I think I first heard from you, uh, maybe, uh, the idea of a theory of mind module or network or whatever you want to call it. That is something that allows us to infer what other people are thinking uh, and, and their perspective from their, their behavior and, 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 and so on. And, you know, brain scans, now these, these people who, who uh, are not necessarily approaching it from an evolutionary point of view, but doing these brain scans are finding something 
uh, uh, coherent, I think, a network, a distributed network in the brain that seems to be activated by these kinds of inferential tasks, right? Uh yeah, I wouldn't say actually, I mean, the theory of mind stuff, you may have heard from me, but it's not my work, but no, some I know. of the people that started in that, that area, like Alan Leslie and Simon Baron Cohen, they do think about, um, they actually did think about this from the point of view of natural selection, and they did have evolutionary considerations in mind uh, when they were first formulating these ideas. Um, but sure, I mean, there's, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of controversy about what exactly should be counted as serious. Is it just predicting and explaining people's beliefs and desires, or is it broader, you know, broader kinds of social inferences, in which case you're going to have a lot of, of other systems activated? But sure, I, I mean, I think that the, um, the brain scanning, there are times when it answers really interesting questions about the fracture points of our minds, and, and there are times when it's just looking at localization, and there's times when it's misguided. There's all, all those things happen with, with it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it can, it can sometimes tell you really interesting things. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think I've exhausted my fund of questions related to modules and the so-called self. Um, but if there's anything else you want to say about anything in the world, including emotions, modules... That's a question I never expected. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, more or less what what I, I would just say what you were saying before that that understanding how our minds work is a lot of people go into psychology because they want to make the world a better place, and they realize that you have to understand something about human nature to do that. And I think that that's deeply true. Whatever you, no matter what it is that you think will make the world a better place. You're not going to be able to achieve that without really understanding in a deep way the mechanisms of our mind. I mean, once you understand it, and when you think about it from a, the position of that there's lots of different systems in our heads, some are for coalitional psychology, like the psychology of us versus them, mm -hmm. and that, that's going to be at the root of things like warfare a lot of the times. Um, some are having to do with mating, some are having to do with foraging. There's a lot of these different mechanisms in our head, yet people aren't acting on all of them all the time. There's nobody that I know of at war in Santa Barbara right now, but in other parts of the world, there's a huge amount of war. There's going to be situations that activate that system and, and impose those frames of reference on how you're thinking about situations. If you, if, if, if people were more willing to think from an evolutionary perspective about these functionally specialized systems and what their design is and what kinds of cues activate, activate them, I think you have more of a chance of actually improving, improving the world. Then if you just go like this and say, no, no, nothing evolved, there's nothing, there's right. nothing specialized right. in our heads. Um, I think that's, that's the way that you end up doing disastrous things that end up with people in misery and, uh, and dead, as opposed to really understanding how the mind works. We agree on that. And I think it would also be useful sometimes if people saw more continuity between their experience, their conscious experience, and what seems the incomprehensible behavior of these people who are at war. I mean, it seems to me that every day I impose biases on my view of the world, like who owes me what and how much I owe them and how mad I should be at people, which if the stakes started getting higher, like I started feeling physically threatened, those same mechanisms would lead me to do, you know, God knows what. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm yet to see, no matter how discreditable it is, I'm yet to see something in the world that I don't feel, at least in some little way, tweaked in myself. Um, but you have to really be open to that possibility to experience. If you're not having the triggering circumstances somebody else is having, becoming self-aware in that sense, it, it requires being relaxed and saying, okay, I'm a human being, I'm a member of a particular species, I have a certain kind of design. I don't know everything about the design, but is there anything like that in me? Is there anything that's pulling me in a direction like that? And I, I think that that's a useful kind of self-awareness to have. Well, and one, one reason it's hard is we seem designed by natural selection for it to, in certain cases, be hard. I mean, if you look at the way we attribute motivations to people once we've defined them as the enemy, and, and you know, we're, we're almost designed not to be able to see their point of view in some in some ways. Yes, that often happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so 
I, I want to just a final observation, see if you agree or a question. Um, uh, if, in talking this through with you, I've, I've only become more mindful of how complicated it all is and, and, and like modules within modules within modules and, and, and it's not even as neat as just Russian dolls. There's all these interconnections. And I'm wondering if sometimes do you kind of think, well, look, maybe it'd be better to describe some of this stuff as networks or maybe just let people use whatever terms they want. Maybe being too insistent on this modules terminology is going to get in the way or what? Well, I've abandoned the term module just because it, with the Jerry Fodor um, way of thinking about it, I think that, that gets in, I think the way he's framed it gets in the way. I think in terms of uh, functionally specialized mechanisms, mechanisms um, that are, that, that were engineered by natural selection to solve particular problems. And they're going to be, they're going to be interconnected in a lot of different ways because ultimately their outputs have to be coordinated to produce behavior. Right? Um, there's going to be one body that's going to be behaving and somehow it all has to be coordinated. So um, I, I think about functional specialization and some functionally specialized mechanisms will be very domain specific. They'll be very targeted for a particular kind of adaptive, a particular domain of life, you know, like, you know, we were talking about us versus them, psychology versus mating versus dyadic reciprocity. And others others may be more domain general. I, in our own research, I, we haven't really found too many constraints on the kinds of things that our mechanisms for judging probability can operate over. You know, um, We haven't found too many domain constraints on that. So there can be in, in, in the head functional specializations that are very very domain specific, content specific, that they have a lot of content in them, and other ones that are more domain general, and they are all gonna operate together in, in producing our behavior. So yeah, it's it's really complicated, and we're at the, at the beginning, uh, not near the end of investigations like this. Um, so you're not using the term mod modular I don't. I, I I found that people there's a concept of information encapsulation that people apply because of Jerry Fodor. This is the notion that it's that everything's like a pipeline it's from per perception to inference and, and action, and that information that goes into that module that pipeline can't interact with other information in the head. And I just think that's wrong. That's not the way to think about it. Um, and that's never anything that that John or I intended. To and intended anybody to to interpret what we we're saying as I, I I was surprised you know when I was years ago when I was first going around giving job talks and horrifying people all over the place um, you know somebody asked me would the work that that we've done on on um, mechanisms specialized for detecting cheaters that they said to me well if you think this is a module what's the evidence that it's information encapsulated? And I was very shocked by that question because I said, what, what makes you think that it would be information encapsulated? And he said, the, the person said, well, because you called it a module. That's taking Jerry Fodor's very limited definition um, as the only way of thinking about it. So the, re the only reason I've stopped using that term is just because it's certain terms invite um, in misunderstandings because of the history of their usage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if everybody was using it in the original artificial intelligence way of a mechanism well engineered for solving a particular problem, there would be no problem. And I'd be happy to use it all the time. Mm -hmm. But there's no s other single adjective that could come before uh, theory of the mind or model of the mind the way you, you know, modular model of the mind. Well, it's full of adaptive specializations. That's more than like that word. Gunner. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's it's two words, but or, or adaptation. These are adaptations. An adaptationist view of the mind. They're cognitive adaptations. Um, I'm happy to put it that way. Um, and, and, you know, Randy Gallistel at, at, at Rutgers, he is, he puts it, it's adaptations all the way down. Um, right, right. it's hard to find a level, uh, even from the, the iron on, and a, and a, in, in hemoglobin, uh, where you're not dealing with some adaptive specialization, you know, the, the iron that the oxygen is attaching to an adaptive specialization. The lungs have structure, adaptive specializations all through the lungs. Um, suffocation alarm response. At all these different levels, you're finding adaptations and they're functionally organized and functionally integrated. And that's the way to 
to think about it. I mean, I guess the connotation of modular I like, and maybe this isn't inherent in it anyway, I've just come to associate it with the term, is the connotation of decentralization. That is relative to the, relative to the intuition that there is this chief executive conscious self giving orders, uh, you know, Yes, I mean that that's that's contained also in the notion that there's many cognitive adaptations in our heads. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, in that sense, it's it's a good word. In that sense, it started out a good word. I like it. Some people talk about massive modularity, um, by which they mean a massive number of these adaptive specializations uh, in our heads. That and that's useful. That's actually good because it reminds me of the term massive parallelism, which also speaks of decentralization. That's right. Okay. Well, this has been very interesting and helpful to me personally, Lee. I really appreciate your taking the time when I know you're, you've got a cold or something. It's, it's been fun. Okay. It's been okay. nice to see you after all this time. It really? And, and uh, let's do it again before too long. Okay. Take care.